Now, I, I wouldn't normally do this, but I believe it's in everyone's best interest that I reveal a few of the details. And the point of this is to protect those who are involved as well as to keep your minds from making too much of this situation or making too little of it. And that's the only reason why we do this. For several weeks, um, between the two of them, there was a lot of flirting going on. There were inappropriate conversations and uh, text messages were exchanged. There was hugging, embracing, and there was one kiss exchanged but it stopped there. She sent him a text letting him know that she was ready to take the relationship to the next level. He said he was not interested at that point. And yet the counseling relationship continued um, between the two spouses until, uh, and uh, both spouses were unaware that anything had gone on until about a week ago. When we, the elders, found out about this uh, last Saturday, we spoke with him, prayed, we discussed the situation, and the elders were unanimous in deciding that he should no longer be a pastor here at Cornerstone Church. Having said that, please understand that this does not mean that he is no longer a dear brother to us, a loved and integral part of our church family. It does mean that his character, based upon recent action, disqualifies him from current pastoral leadership. And I want you guys just to be assured that uh, we have uh, people walking with him. We have people walking with his wife. We have people walking with the other woman. And we have people walking with her husband. And they're being cared for. They're being counseled. They're being prayed for by many people. And I would encourage you to do the same. I, I was praying about what to say at this service and where to go from here because you kind of drop a bomb like that and then now what? Um, and after prayer and thinking and, and everything else, I really believe what God wants us to do at this point is to take our eyes off of their situation and onto our own. See, it's very, it's very easy right now for your mind to go, okay, well, I think the elders should do this. I think they should do this. I think he should do this. I think she should. Uh, it, it, it doesn't really matter at this point. Um, and you, you have to trust the elders of the church um, as we've prayed it through, as the leaders of the church, uh, we've prayed together and unanimously come to this decision. You may disagree one way or another and say, well, he should be permanently disqualified or he shouldn't be, you know, I, I also I want you to think about the arrogance in that, first of all, to think, okay, here are these men who have prayed it through, godly men, leaders of the church, they come to unanimous decision, but somehow you um, came up with a better one just, just think about the arrogance of that. Not that we can't be wrong, but at the same time, remember that God has placed us to. There's a, a designation that God put these men in as the leaders of the church and to trust that and believe the process of God. Um, but I really believe that what God wants us to do at this point is, is for us to look at ourselves. And, and I know this is hard for some people. I, I was even thinking about it. I, I was driving in from San Diego this morning, and I was, I was praying, praying, praying about this morning. And, and this is a huge problem. This is, uh, I was thinking about what a massive problem this is for some people, where it is so hard for some people to do self-evaluation. 
There's just certain people, and I, and I don't understand it, but there's certain people that are great at talking about other people's sins and other people's issues, but there's like a block to where you're very good at judging other people and you don't look at your own life. And I, and I, I don't know, I don't understand that because I, I think ever since I was a kid, I was uh, very hard on myself of anything and constantly looking at my own life, but there are, there are many people who, who are very good and just want to talk about other people's issues and not deal with their own. And, and I was praying because I'm thinking, okay, well, how do I explain that to a person who doesn't think about themselves? You know, I'm trying to get people who don't normally consider their own actions to consider their own actions. And I just, I just prayed. I just prayed and said, God, I don't know how to do that. There are certain people in this room that you're so good at pointing out the flaws of other people, and yet you don't take time to see that there's so much garbage in your own life. Much like the Pharisees who could see what was wrong with everyone else, every tiny detail of other people's lives, but somehow were blinded to the issues in their own lives. And as I prayed about this morning, I really believe what God wanted us to do was each of us look at our own lives to trust the process that, that God is using um, with those involved in the other situation and, and say, you know what, they're taken care of. Take my word for it that there, there are people that are looking after them and caring for them and doing a great job at it. And our responsibility now is to look at ourselves um, because I believe the greatest thing we can do right now is use this opportunity to get rid of the impurity in this room. Because as I describe that situation, we know that this can happen to any of us in this room. And we also know that it is happening in this room. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot of hidden sin in this room. And you can wait until the day that God exposes that. Or you yourself can come before him today and cleanse yourself of that. This has been an amazing week for me, honestly. Um, it's, uh, it was a great week for me to look at my own life and get rid of junk any type of junk. See, sometimes we think that there's like this, uh, this safe zone where you're not necessarily pursuing the things of the Spirit, but you're also not totally in sin yet. You know, there's like this thought, like we think that there's this fence that we can walk where there's a little bit of flirting, a little bit of talking, a little bit of thoughts going here and there. You know, maybe a little Facebook comment here, a little text here, a little, you know, word here, and, and just thoughts going on in the mind. Well, I haven't actually sinned. I haven't crossed that line because nothing physical has happened yet. And yet, you guys, that's not, I don't see that in Scripture. There's, there's not this fence we can walk on. Either you pursue the things of God or you pursue the things of the flesh. There is no fence. If there's a fence, Satan owns it. And we have to look at our lives and go, okay, where, where, where is the impurity? Where am I playing games in my own mind and saying this is okay, even though I would never do it in the presence of Jesus Christ? Um, and it's been a great week for me, I got to tell you. It was, uh, you know, you, there's certain areas where you think, oh, I'm doing good, I'm doing good. But you say it just like that, I, I think I'm doing okay. And what a wonderful week for me to say, no, you know, there's some games that go on in my mind. There's some conversations that take place that, that I don't think cross lines. But, you know, when you come down to it, you go, man, maybe that, that I, I'm not thinking about God at that moment. And so let me just get that out of my mind. Let me get that out of my life. Because this affair started with little things that we call harmless flirting or not crossing a line as though the words or the thoughts were not sin themselves when they were. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. I love that phrase. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. Everything. 
Every single thought, you take it, you take it captive like it's your prisoner. You interrogate it and go, okay, is this of God? Is this what God wants me thinking? Is this what God wants me saying? Because this is his body. This, if I've truly given my mouth over to God, God, this is your mouth. These are your hands. These are your eyes. You know what, Lord? Do with this body what you want. You are the Lord of this body. So God, I don't want any words coming out of this mouth. I don't want, this is your brain. So I, I every thought that comes in, I want to take it captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Take that thought, interrogate, and go, is that what Jesus wants me thinking right now? Oh, and I pray that this would be a great week for you, just to take every single thought captive, everything that you go, okay, was that sin or not, just to evaluate everything, to interrogate every thought, everything you watch, and just go, okay, is this of the Lord? Um, want some good news? <laughs> uh, on Thursday, Lisa and I celebrated our 15th anniversary. <laughs> All right. Um, let's kind of turn a corner here. And uh, I went down to San Diego. That's where I drove back from this morning so I could be here to, to talk this over with you guys. Um, but I will say, I, and I, I, I can stand before God right now, and tell you, I love this woman more than I ever have. Um, I honestly mean that. I am, I am crazy about her. There is no one I'd rather be with um, at all. She's uh, um, just, an, it's been amazing, amazing, you know? And, and those of you guys that have been down that road 15 years, it's amazing how it just flies by. Um, I can say that I, I, I desire her. I don't know if I'm getting, you know, uh, TMI, too much information, but uh, um, I think it's good for you to know that I, I desire my wife more than I ever have, and that may sound crazy to some of you that are younger and go, man, how does that happen 15 years later, um, I, but I can honestly stand before you with all integrity and say, oh man, it, it, it was a good time this weekend. Um, I... Uh, <laughs> One of the things that, uh, <laughs> we're married, it's okay. This is, this is the way God designed it. Um, I, uh, one of the things, though, that I, I, I told my wife, you know, this last week uh, that I just thanked her for as we look over these 15 years, the one thing I really thanked her for was, uh, and I think in light of the situation, I, I go, you know, at least in 15 years, I have never seen you even be the tiniest bit flirtatious with another man. Not, not even one bit. And I just thanked her for not being that way, never being flirtatious. I've never seen her act or speak, not even one sentence, not even one email sentence, not even one Facebook comment that's even questionable or not even the tiniest bit inappropriate. And I just, I just thanked her for that um, because in 15 years, I have never, never questioned her loyalty. And as a husband, that type of devotion means the world to me. You know, it's just an amazing thing as a husband to go, you know what, you have never, you've never been flirtatious. I have never questioned you. I have no doubt in my mind that you've been faithful to me, not just in action, but even in your thoughts. And as a husband, I don't know what you can ask for more. That's what every, that's what every husband wants. Everyone, every husband wants to know, just be absolutely sure, you know what? I, I know she's faithful to me, and I've seen the way she talks. I see when other people flirt with her. And I see when other people are pursuing her, and I see her response even, you know, even when she knows, she, when she doesn't even know I'm looking, I'm just going, you know what, it's just, there's just a purity of that. She's not going to go there. She's not going to play those games. Uh, it's just a great thing to be able to say that after 15 years and 15 years, my bride has always been faithful to me. And that's such a great statement to make. It feels good to make it. It's what every guy dreams of being able to say. 
and I praise God for his grace that, uh, that I get a wife like that. Um, my bride's faithful to me, and I was thinking about that passage in Ephesians 5, verse 25 through 27. It says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. I, I've preached this passage so many times, and when I first got married, I looked at this, and it was about marriage. And anytime I did a, 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 a marriage ceremony, I would turn to this passage. Anytime I'm doing premarital counseling, I would turn to this passage, and I would point out, look, husbands, love your wives. That, that our job as husbands is to love our wives, to cherish our wives. And he says, in the same way that Christ loved the church. In the same way that Christ loved the church. The way Jesus loved the church is the model for us in marriage. And, and what did he do to the church? He, uh, he gave himself up for her. So husbands, we give ourselves up for our wives. We sacrifice in the same way that Jesus did for the church. It says that he might sanctify her. I say in the same way we with our wives need to bring them to this, 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 uh, through this process of sanctification through our job as spiritual leaders we'll be leading our wives to further and further purity. That he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Uh, like I said earlier, every guy wants his wife that way, just spotless, holy, without blemish. Man, you have no idea how blessed I feel to say, you know what, I can say that about my wife. Like I say, that is the greatest blessing. And yet, having said that, and at all being true, Ephesians 5, the Bible makes clear that Paul was not talking about human marriage so much as he was talking about Christ and the church and that great mystery. And this passage is about the church and about Jesus' passion for the church and the fact that he gave himself up so that we, his bride, his church, might be holy and blameless, spotless, shameless. And, and as we're singing and during worship today, and I, you know, just this morning, I'm, 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 I'm crying during worship because I'm going, God, you know, I'm not thinking so much about your bride as a whole, the church, the people in this room. We are the bride of Christ. And in the same way that I go, man, I love the fact that my wife is so pure and those thoughts don't even go through her head, it doesn't seem, you know, or none of, it's just, I love that, I love that, I love that about her and I cherish that about her that God was just constantly revealing to me during worship, you know what, that's what I want in my bride. That's what I want when I look down in this room. And I know some of you guys go, man, friends, you get so intense about sin and getting rid of this and that. And, and, and yeah, you know, maybe sometimes I, I have gotten too like, legalistic and dealing with this issue, that issue. But, but the, the point is, is there's this desire of this one that we love, God. You know, he looks in this room and the thing that he wants, the same thing I want for my bride. He wants to see purity in here. That's why when something like this happens in the church, there's this, this pain, there's this pain uh, on an earthly sense, but there's a greater pain in the thought of, oh God, I didn't want that for your bride. I don't like you seeing that in your bride because I know how much you desire purity. I desired in my wife. And now God, you desired in this room and not just amongst the leadership, but amongst all of us. And that's why it's hard in the beginning. I, I don't think it ever hit me this strong, this, this strongly, that how, uh, how I know there's stuff going on in this room. We all know there's stuff going on in this room. We all know that there's actual affairs, true, full-blown, hardcore affairs going in this room right now. There are people of you, people in here, committing adultery, full blown adultery. And I just think, man, I'm sorry, God. 
That's your bride. That's your bride that's doing that. And, and there's just this, this weight of God. I, I mean, I, you got to look at it from God's perspective. When he looks at his bride, and he goes, man, that's going on with my bride. We are the bride of Christ. That's why this is important stuff. This is why it concerns me. It's because we're the bride of Christ and he wants purity as, as every man wants purity in his bride. We also know that there's a, there are emotional affairs going on in this room. Things going on in the heart that are hidden. Some of you are in relationships that are quickly heading toward the, what we'll call a full-blown affair, if you want to call it that, and, and we think that, well, but I haven't gotten there yet, so I'm okay. You guys, uh, we're the bride of Christ. We, the church, are the bride of Christ. We've got to get rid of all of that. Any of those thoughts, taking every thought captive, There's uh, inappropriate things being looked at by the eyes in this room. Whether movies, internet. It's the bride of Christ that's doing that. It's the eyes of Jesus. We're his temple. This is his temple, and I don't want to use his temple for filthy things. These eyes belong to him. This brain belongs to him. And I just want this purification process to take place. Wherever you're at, I, I don't know where you're at. You know, for me, I had to think through, wow, you know what, should I even watch that show? I mean, it's not any, what anyone would consider really bad, but am I doing that for the glory of God? And to even evaluate those things. And, and even going through my, my cell phone and looking at any names going, eh, I don't think so, but maybe. I, you know, let me just get this off, get this off, get this. Just, I don't want anything. I don't want any stain, any wrinkle, any blemish. I want to be pure. I, I want to be a pure bride for Christ. Second Timothy 2.22 says this. It says, flee Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Again, 2 Timothy, easy, 2, 2, 2, 2. 2 Timothy 2, 22. 2 Timothy 2, 22. Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. It doesn't say, you know, if you've got something that tempts you, man, stand there and show self-control. He says, no, youthful passions, you need to run from that. You need to literally run from that. So if you're standing there, you're in sin. The Bible says you run from that. If you're in one of those relationships where you're going, well, it's not, eh, run. It's, it's, it's this idea of, what, why are you there? Why are you there? Because in your mind, there's this ongoing, well, I'm not sinning yet, but you kind of want to keep that option open. And there's different situations where you go, you know what, I just got, I have to run from that. I've got to flee. I've got to flee because I know I could be tempted in this area and so I flee. So we do, we, see, we flee by setting up parameters. We, we flee by sometimes, man, just, just taking every thought captive and, and we flee by looking at our situation. Like for me personally, I go, wow, I travel a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm gone a lot. I'm in these different situations. And, and for me, fleeing meant, you know what, I, I'm not going to go by myself. I don't want to be in another place where I could even be tempted. I don't want to be in a hotel room by myself where, you know what, there's the possibility. Flee for me. For, for 15 years, I've never even had a woman in my car that, that wasn't one of my children or my wife. You know, never alone with another woman. You know what? It just never be alone. And it's just, I got to flee this because there's a possibility. There's a, I've just got to get away. I've got to make sure there's no chance of it. And I'm not going to sit there and play with fire. I'm going to run. I'm going to flee. I'm going to run from any youthful passion. That's why I, I don't even, uh, I don't know, I even counsel women in my office. You know, you know what? There's plenty of women that can counsel other women. 
Um, there, there's plenty of other people to, to do that. You know what? Well, my ca- I'm not even a good counselor, so why, why even uh, <laughs> why I counsel anyone? Um, and some of you that have been counseling, you know, with me go, amen. I, I just, it's, I, I, don't, I don't really listen. You know, so I, I, uh, so I, I just go, okay, you, you know, so let's just, let's just get away from that because it's, it's not going to hurt the church. It's going to only make us stronger and, and let other people do that and do that work. And I'll just stay up here and talk and, and do my deal. You know, flee, flee, run from that. You know, it's interesting because uh, this, this theme of fleeing, um, uh, the exact word there, flee youthful passion and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. This is, this is all throughout Scripture. The Bible is always telling us to do both. You run away from something. We're all called to run away from something, but we're also called to run towards something. See, there are certain places and certain churches where there's so much emphasis on what to run from that your whole life you're just running away from something. You're running away from the sin. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Absolutely. Scripture teaches that, but that can't be our only focus. The focus of Scripture is to pursue something as well. You, you, you got to run. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like dieting. It doesn't just say, you know, run from those unhealthy foods, but pursue what's healthy because you're going to be hungry. You know, you, you pursue what's right. You can't just say, well, I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to eat. No, no, no. You, you just go pursue what's right. You pursue the right type of eating. That's, that's the whole dieting thing. But it's this whole idea of the Bible says, you know, don't just, don't just run from something, run towards something. You flee, definitely run, flee your youthful passions, but make sure you're pursuing the things of God because you can only do one or the other. Like First, First, Thess- First Thessalonians 4 says, abstain from sexual immorality and pursue sanctification. Colossians 3 says, put off all of these deeds of the flesh and then put on all these deeds of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 says, don't walk in the things of the flesh, stay away from those, but walk in the Spirit and pursue the fruit of the Spirit. And all throughout Scripture, you know, it's even in the Old Testament, how they would set them up on these two mountains, and it was like, okay, don't do this, don't do this. If you do this, God's wrath's going to be on you. Do this, do this, do this, and the blessings of God will be upon you. It's, it's always about run from this pursue this. And you got to look in your life. First of all, are you running? Are you fleeing those things that are temptations to you? Are you truly running from them and praying like we do in the Lord's Prayer? God, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. I'm agreeing with you. I hate that stuff. I just want to run as far from it as possible. Are you really running? Are you sitting there playing with fire? And then are you pursuing the things of God? Because Galatians 5 Go so far as to say that, that walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In fact, our true safeguard is not just to keep running from things, but the Bible says, actually, if you just pursue moment by moment what the Spirit wants you to do, if you just keep in step with the Spirit, you don't even really need to worry about the other stuff. Because he says, if you walk by the Spirit, you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Because he says, the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. They're opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So he says, if, you're, if I'm right now think, okay, Holy Spirit, what would you want me to do? What would you want me to say? As long as I'm focused on that, I'll never sin. Never. It's the moment I stop pursuing the things of the Spirit that I I think I'm in this neutral point and suddenly these other thoughts can creep into my mind because my mind is not thinking, what does God want me to do right now? What does God want me to do right now? My mind's just kind of there. It's in neutral. And when it's in neutral, it can be pushed. And it's this whole idea of no, but when I'm when I'm uh, when I'm driving towards something, it's like when you put the you know your 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 car on D, which stands for drive. You know that? Okay. It's it's you know what I'm going. I'm heading this direction. I'm I'm heading this direction. You can't push me backwards. You know. And some of you are in neutral. Some of you guys are in reverse. You know. I just made that up. That's pretty good. Okay. Um, <laughs> I. Uh, I, I want to, I'm going to use that next service too. Um, 
I, I want to use, uh, I just want to read some verses to you because uh, in, in John, John 17, when Jesus was leaving the earth, he prays for his disciples. Remember that prayer? Awesome prayer. Where he first he just says, Father, the time is done. My time, my, my, my time here is done. The time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. And, and he talks about how I completed the work you gave me to do. But then he starts praying for the people that were staying. Because Jesus was going to leave the earth. He goes, I want to pray for my disciples. I want to pray for these guys. He goes, he goes, I'm not praying that you take them out of the earth. He goes, but I want to pray that you protect them from the evil one. Jesus was well aware that there are so many traps in this world. There's so many things in this world to ensnare us, especially in this area. And, and, uh, and so he prayed. He says, God, you know, I'm seeing Satan on this earth. I'm seeing the temptation that's out there. He knew what was going to be coming in 2009. He knew all of this stuff. And he says, I pray for them. He goes, I, I pray that you protect them from the evil one. And then in verse 17, he says, sanctify them. Sanctify them by the truth, God. Purify your body. Purify these people with the truth. And your word is the truth. That's why last week we read through the whole book of Ecclesiastes. There's something purifying, just listening to the word. And so I thought, you know, let's listen to the word a little bit more. Let's just read a couple of chapters today. But first I want to I wanna read to you Proverbs 6. It's amazing when you read the book of Proverbs, you find out how much it talks about this area of, of sexual immorality um, and, and how much this is a, such a real temptation. And so Solomon in his wisdom writes about this, knowing that we in this room would be trapped by this, tempted by this. Proverbs six twenty three says, For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. To preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress, do not desire her beauty in your heart, and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. For the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread, but a married woman hunts down a precious life. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes in to his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he is hungry, but if he is caught, he'll pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house." He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. Wounds and honor he will get, and his disgrace will not be wiped away. I'm going to have a couple guys read uh, two, two more chapters, and uh, we're going to close with that. Um, I, I've asked Josh Walker to come up and read chapter 5, and then... Uh, and I've asked Larry Thrasher if you'll come on up too and read uh, chapter 7. Um, for us just to listen to the word of God and, and think this through. But even before he reads, let me just say one thing again. You guys, evaluate your own life in light of this. Think through what it means to flee for you. Let me, let me throw one more thought and then I'll let these guys read. Sorry. Um, you know, when we read these passages about the adulterous woman, it's really written to the guys. Um, Proverbs 5 and 7 really are written, you know, and it's, it's, it's an older man writing to, you know, he calls my son, my son, you know, just think this through. They're going to be traps. They're going to do this and they're going to try to seduce you and this. And you got to run from that. Man of God, run from that. Get away from that. But before they read, I do want to address the ladies for a second too. Um, you know, ever since you're in junior high, you know, it's, it's never... You never wanted to be that woman. The whore, they would call her, the slut. You know, you, you never wanted that reputation. And 
And sometimes, even for you ladies, you can feel like, well, because I'm not that, or maybe, maybe you have been in the past, and I will say that God can cleanse you of that, purify you completely into this beautiful, pure and spotless bride, because that's what he does, that's what Jesus does. But at the same time, for you, I want to say, you know, be careful in every action. Um, and I know some of the pain goes so deep to insecurities and bad relationships with your dads, their husbands, abusive relationships. I understand it can cause all sorts of pain and garbage to enter into you. At the same time, there's never an excuse for actions, and you've got to take hold of that. And I understand that when a guy lusts or has those improper thoughts, it is his fault. It is 100% his fault, and he needs to take that into consideration and deal with it before God. At the same time, the Bible also talks about being a stumbling block and being careful. And one of the comments I get back about Cornerstone Church is, uh, is the way women dress in the summertime. And uh, some of you dress very inappropriately. You just do. And I understand, you know, maybe your mom dresses that way and she's all hooched out. So that's, you grew up just thinking, oh, that's... <laughs> That's what I do. That's all I know, you know? And I, let me just throw it out in terms you understand. Uh, and so you don't think there's anything bad, or also I know that some of the insecurity drives you to that, and you want attention so badly, and you want that attention from a man so badly, and you love when guys look at you. You love to feel beautiful. Every woman loves that. As, as, as pure, you know, as my wife is, she, she just, she'll tell me flat, you know what, it still feels good that uh, these guys look and, you know, whatever, there's just that, ah, uh, you know, why is that still there? And there's just, it, it does, I, I, I've never been a woman, but I can imagine, uh, I, I do have a woman's name, though, and so I, <laughs> I understand some of this, um, but it's, it's just that, that desire, that desire to be looked upon. Um, and I'm just saying, even as you get dressed in the morning, are you thinking about the glory of God? Are you thinking, Jesus, how would you want me to dress? How would you want me to conduct myself? How would you want me to conduct my conversations with guys? Um, because you don't want to be that girl. Um, and again, just like I'm saying to the guys, we're not just talking about the extremes here and thinking there's a safe ground in here. But it's to take every thought captive and go, why do I want that attention? Why do I want to be looked at? Is it for the glory of God? Am I really doing this for my husband or am I really doing it because I want to draw attention to myself and my body? And, and that's, it is a sin. It is wrong. I'm not excusing what the guys do. I'm just saying as sisters in Christ, um, for you to love on us guys uh, would mean you would make it less tempting for us and dress appropriately. And I'm saying that as, as your pastor, that uh, it's, it, it gets very difficult. And I say this in the dead of winter. Uh, I know it's winter Southern California, you know, but still I figure, you know, this is a good time to address it. So don't embarrass anyone. Um, but, but for you to really think this through and go, okay, how do I honor God by the way I dress? And so, uh, but now let's just listen to the word of God now. Proverbs. <clears throat> Proverbs 5. My son, be attentive to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding, that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps follow the path to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life, her ways wander, and she does not know it. And now, O sons, listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her and do not go near to the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless, lest strangers take the fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed and you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. 
Drink water <clears throat> from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight, be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your kinsman. They will keep you from the adulteress, from the wayward life, wife with her seductive words. At the window of my house, I looked out through the lattice. I saw among the simple. I noticed among the young men a youth who lacked judgment. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house. At twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in, then out came a woman to meet him dressed like a prostitute with crafty intent. She is loud and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares, at every corner she lurks. She took hold of him and kissed him, and with a brazen face she said, I have fellowship offerings at home. Today I fulfilled my vows, so I came out to meet you. I looked for you and have found you. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with mirth, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deep of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money and will not be home till full moon. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with all her smooth talk. All at once he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose, till the arrow pierces his liver like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. Many are victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave leading down to the chambers of death. Some of you guys hear those words and it kills you because you've given in. But you guys, that's why we're in this room. And that's why we can celebrate is because of what Jesus Christ did. That he can forgive you of anything that you've done and I don't want make, to make this all about, this, make this religious to where you do good and you run from bad, because this is about a relationship. It's about a relationship, a love relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you know why we run from that sin? It's because Jesus Christ is better. And you gotta keep that in your mind. The reason why we walked away from our old life is because we found something better. 
The reason why we sold everything we had was because this treasure was better. I'm not just asking you to run from your sin because it's bad. I'm asking you to run toward Jesus because he's better. For you to say, well, this relationship is enticing, but Jesus is better. And to look at God to say and say, you know what? I want you more than I want this relationship. Yeah, this pornography, I enjoy it. But you know what, Jesus? You're better than pornography. And so I'm going to run to you because you are better. Yeah, you know what, this attention I get from guys, I enjoy it, but you know what, the attention I get from you, almighty Jesus, is better. And I'm gonna run to you, run to you, run to you. That's what this is about. It's not about a religious exercise where we get all this junk out of our lives because it's bad stuff. Sure, that's true. But we run to Jesus because he is so much better and can bring so much more fulfillment. And that's what baptism is. You get baptized, you're dying to that old you and those old relationship and that old junk and you're rising to a better relationship where you're gonna be in union with Jesus Christ. And if that's your desire this morning, then uh, there'll be people here in the prayer room to pray for you during the worship time. Um, And you can get baptized. Uh, Maybe some of you guys need to do some confessing this week. Um, If you need someone to pray with or talk to, I encourage you to email the church, call the church. And we'll, we'll hook you up with your, um, a leader in your community that'll truly pray with you and build a relationship with you and talk you through these things. Um, but we're going to put it on your shoulders that if that's something that God is calling you to do, then you can pray with someone this morning. Um, and again, the rest of us, as we worship now, let's, uh, let's do this in a pursuit of Jesus. Let's not just run from our sin, but even as we're praying right now, Let's run into the arms of Jesus and just tell him he's better. He's so much better.